Well, I've collected some pretty weird baits over the years and caught a few fish on them as well. But one of the weirdest old school ones that you're going to find in these books, many of the old books have it, for the species in the freshwater we get called the chub, was a slug. And you had to split the belly open of the slug to reveal the white meat beneath. They were deadly for chub. I thought, I'm going to try those sooner or later. I tried them many years ago. I'm going to give it a good go, but I need to stockpile some slugs, you know, ready for bait. I thought, I'll freeze them down. But first, I've got to wait for the right conditions. All you gardeners out there know, slugs usually come out after rain. And oh boy, was I going to get some rain. So, I'm going to take a look as the sun's dropping, see if I find some slugs in the garden. With the wife, we have cut our lawn. Our lawn is relatively large. It takes us hours to cut it. And of course, it's shaded now by the oak tree. Very moist here because we've had a thunderstorm. The thunderstorm's made it uh, some here moist, so we're going to get, yes sirree, plenty of bait in the shape of slugs. It's estimated there are 40 species of slug in the UK. Also estimated that approximately 8 million pounds of the damage is caused to agricultural crops each year. And the largest one, wait for this, 25 centimetres, 10 inches long. The yellow slug, also known as terrestrial pulmonate gastropod mollusk. Whew, I need to lie down after saying all that. Well, people, I'm having something of a result with those slugs. I'm getting off a quarter of a bait tin full at the moment, a couple of snails in there as well. Snails, not really bad at the moment. I'm going to check over my, tom my tomato plants, but these guys aren't going to chew the heads off my flowers or my tomato plants anymore. Well, I have another 20 minutes of this because the sun's getting lower. They're definitely coming out of the dam. I feel if I came out here tonight, I'd get some as well. There's moist ground. But... I'm going to make enough here to cut and split up, get up there and see if I can. Well, they're going to be frozen first and then they're going to be cut open, split open like it says in the books and used as bait for chub. So let's keep going. <laughs> it's not a good evening to be a slug in my garden. I like checking out absolutely anywhere because by lifting this slab away you can see the ground on the left by the leaves is slightly damper. And indeed, here we go, is Mr Slug. So the ground on the right is dry, they won't like that, but where it's damp, along the edge of those leaves, anywhere it's moist, you can pick these slugs up. Obviously, after a big rainstorm and damp conditions and snails come out as well. The snails are a lot softer to use as a hook bait. In fact, I think in France they eat them, don't they? Yucky, not for me, but I have no problem putting snails, and I've called on them before. It's one of those old school baits that nobody seems to use nowadays. And look at this one. This looks like something out of Jurassic Park. And as for spotting, one of those large grey green ones or whatever they are, 10 inches long. Oh my God, what size hook do I want for that? 8 0, 10 0, 12 0. Of course, when you touch them, they roll up into a ball, all ready to be put into ha ha ha, my bait box. Well, I actually think I found the honey pot of slugs. And I never knew this till I actually looked. But I thought the bottom of the bird feed, all the bits and pieces were always gone, all the seeds. I thought, maybe it's mice, I don't know. No, it's a horde of slugs. Check this out. They are absolutely coming, I guess, underneath the patio. They are all the way over. Different coloured ones, and they're feeding. You can see all this. Look at this jumbo one there. One, two, three, four five, six, seven, on the left over, bits of the bird seed, the whole bird feeder. So they're doing a job for me, I'm going to leave those, I've got enough for bait, but I've learned something there, that after that thunderstorm and mowing the grass at the same time, it has brought out loads and loads of slugs, even down to albino ones like this one. Peculiar, look, they're everywhere. Well, at least I know where I can get some more bait from, for sure. They've given these guys 
about an hour and you can see they've turned upside down and they've suckered themselves to the lid here where obviously the pinholes are because they're bait containers and these guys have done the same I've only just got a second box but if I turn them over everything is there a lot of slugs I feel I've got a load of bait here gonna have to wash these boxes out again I've got a couple of snails and I'm gonna freeze this lot now freeze them all down and then hopefully they don't get too yuck I didn't want to touch that one they don't get too gunky back you get in guys and then I can break them down when they're thawed out. I can break them down. That's when we're going to take them chub fishing. Well, no, actually, they're not the ones going fishing. They're the bait. <laughs> well, I certainly got myself a good supply of slugs for the next chub trip. Watch out those fish on the river. I'll be coming to slug it out with you. <laughs> I don't know what I think about myself. Anyway, what about trout fishermen? They like sort of weird flies, don't they? I know because I am one. I've got far too many flies in my fly box. Most of them don't get used. But in the hot, still summers of the UK, when those lakes are getting really, really tough, do you know what one of the best ones to use is? A bear hook. That's right, an absolutely bear hook. So what I do, I like quite a white gape hook. I get a bear hook and I just put white paint around it. It could be emulsion, but it can wash off. Who cares, it's only one trip. Gloss paint is better, just around from the eye of the hook, the back of the eye of the hook, round the bottom of the bend. You can just dab away at it, get some car paints with little pen car paints, they're quite good. And make sure you keep your, you know, your paint off of the point. If you do get paint on the point, make sure you file it off or just rub it off with a little bit of uh, wet and dry, something fine, a fine grain one. That's one, that's very good. Slow sinking, because you only have the weight of the hook. If you want a little bit extra weight, you can use very similar to what they used to call the Oliver Kite Bear Hook Nymph, which was just copper dressing, just copper wire around the hook. It is deadly. Just, I, look, I don't go and buy a load of copper wire. If you find an odd piece of cable laying around, if it's fine enough, you can unravel the strands, get five or six strands, roll them all up again, get them to the right thickness you want, and then whip them over. A dab of super glue over the top just keeps it in place for when you're casting. That will be a medium sink fly. If you want a fast sink fly, I'm calling the flies, a fast sink bare hook, why not get a split shot, crush it around just behind the eye of the hook onto actually the wire. I like it flat, so here's the hook, here's the hook point. I do it sideways, there's a hook, turn it that way. I like to have it flat this way, so the hook point's down here. Crush it flat, and then uh, super glue over the top and or white paint, that's deadly. Best thing we can do, guys, is get down that lake and see if any of these things actually work. Well, I'm going to try first over on what I call the Long Lake, I'm going to call it, because I fished it about 40 odd years ago when it was first opened down here at Rockbourne. I'm going to give it a go with basically the wire one that we showed you, over whipped with a yellow fluoro paint just bonded over the top, super glue bonded over the top. Then I'm going to go to this one, which I've already tied on, but I'm not going to start with, which I call my flathead, which is, which is basically the tungsten, the flathead shot crushed on the line. And when you strip that in fast, it has a most peculiar action. Like this, it's all over the place. It drives them nuts. I'm going to give that a go, and I'll probably go right down to a totally bear hook. But anything like a bear hook has always worked. As I say, it's worth a try, and in the right hands on the right day, it can be, especially in summer, absolutely deadly. Oh guys, I've got a big fish on. A big fish. Looks over five pounds. Ripping the surface up at the moment. 
bring that round for you. Now, should I get this fish? You guys are going to want to know. So what fly are you using? I'll tell you when we get back at the Totally Awesome Workshop and show you. It's not a fly, no dressing, no wings, no hackle, no eyes. It's a bear hook nymph. It is, on the right days, absolutely deadly. Oh. Well, I'm on stealth mode with the reel. This fly is absolutely deadly. Bear hook nymph, different variations. This is one with the fluoro yellow on it. So it's basically just paint and a wrap of wire. Just gonna show it to you here. If we can get him up. Nice fish, nice fish as well. You might just be able to see that yellow tag mark just in his drawer down there. I don't know if you're going to see it or not. Let's see if we can get a bit closer without dropping the camera in the water. Oh, he's going well. He's going well, this fish. He's going well. There he is. Come on, fish. Be good for the camera. Be good for the camera. There you can see in the picture a static trout, but wait, in the foreground, zooming past the front, is a rainbow trout. Now that one is more likely to be a little bit more aggressive, I've actually followed it with a camera, that's the sort of trout that should or would take a bear hook nymph. Second fish on guys, changed to the white flathead one, which has got quite a shimmy and shape to it. Margin fishing, dropping it vertically, degrees some of the line, and down here in front of the rushes, just juggled it up and down. He couldn't resist that flash. The ironic thing is there's two others following him around. The clarity is unbelievable. I've also dropped the ratchet out so I'm in stealth mode. There's quite a few fish moving in this pool, actually. If I can get you a shot on this one, thrash in the water to foam. Come up. There he is. There he comes. Net time, I feel. if I can get it sorted out. Here he comes. There he goes. Here he comes, there he goes. What a scrapper. Too late though. He is in. A totally awesome net. Pristine, pristine rainbow trout. I'm going to show him to you so I want you to see the well, flies dropped out of his mouth actually. But just check out this one. Do you know where this one's going? That's right. Just in time for tea. Beauty.
There we go, guys. That's that fly I was using the flathead. And here is one of the finest trout you could expect to see. On his way, yes, to the totally awesome frying pan. Thanks for watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Hope you got some tips there. Don't forget, bear hook nymphs do work. Experiment, have a go yourself, and you cook them up with fish like this. Well, that's some really great action, and all on a bear hook. And of course, that tiny little weight, especially the one that's squashed flat, that one's deadly. Talking about weights, I'm going to the other extreme of fishing, talking giant six gill sharks, maybe broadbill swordfish. Who knows, there could be a huge thresher deep, deep down in the water and you've got to get your bait down there. But it's got to be an expendable breakaway weight to take the bait down. You don't want to be losing legs down there. You want to keep your legs because they're expensive. Why not make some weights that will take the bait down, be cheap, easy to make and expendable? I mean, big weights? How about? And by big, I mean really big. I'm going to be making my weights out of flower pots filled with concrete. I'm going to turn them upside down because I want to rest on the seabed like that. I'm going to cut the bottom off, put some cling film over the base, or rather the top, which would then be the base, and hopefully fill them full of ballast concrete. Let them set, see what they weigh out at, and I feel that's going to take the weight down in the deep water. Listen, it's all an experiment, isn't it? It's all a wonderful experiment. I can't think of anything better to do with flower pots like this because that stops me planting plants because if you have plants they look pretty but then you've got to do weeding. You know what guys I think I could do better with a pair of scissors here making life difficult for myself. I just feel being plastic I think this will cut nice and neat with yes indeedy pair of scissors in fact it's neater I'm using a tenon saw there guys by the way it's much neater running around with the scissors then I can trim up the edge easier look these are going to be expendable weights if they get caught in the bottom I'd rather lose just these and let's say about four pounds of lead which I think I might actually need out in that deep water that's it trim those edges up I mean, you could probably use a standing knife as well, so that's the way it's going to go. And then I'm going to fill it from the top and put a coat hanger wire holder on there so I can tie my breakaway line to it. Let's cut some more up. That one's actually phase two. I've left a bit of a rigid bit around the edge. Maybe that'll help uh, reinforce it while it sets up. So he's got holes in it there. Why am I cutting the edge there? I stupidly ask myself. I've only got a nip like this between the holes because I only need enough to be able to get the cement to go through. Just like this. Now as I don't know what these sizes are going to weigh, I'm actually going to be using some smaller ones, which I think these are like a four inch diameter. And then when they set, then I can weigh them out and it gives me an idea. I may need bigger weights, I don't know, but at least I'm going to have five or ten to start with. Right, next job is to mix up some concrete, got some cement. I've got some, I've got some leftover sharp sand in here, which I think is going to be better than uh, building sand. Let's mix a bit of that in there. Then in goes a load of cement. The mix, if anybody wants to know, doesn't really matter. Four to one, I guess. Doesn't have to be hard, it's only weight, isn't it? It's only weight we're not doing with the, we're not dealing with the structural integrity of a block of flats or somebody's flyover, are we? Can I just uh, want it to set? The main thing is gonna set, because I'm fairly sure some of these weights are gonna go on a one-way ticket where I intend dropping them. Always give it a good mix when it's dry. So the particles of uh, cement mix all in the sand and or ballast. And don't forget down the bottom, it won't, uh, it won't be mixed, it has to be turned over. The 
to boost up the strength of this, I'm going to put some stones in it off the drive here because that effectively makes ballast. I mean, if I was doing this commercially, I would be just buying a bag of ballast. These stones will help sort of bind together with the concrete and make a much better bond with it. So it shouldn't crumble apart quite so easily. Then of course, just like any good cookery program, all you do is add water. The important thing is with ballast, you've got the stones in, there's no absorption in it, no absorption in the stones. So it's a bit like mixing ground bait for fishing. Don't put too much in, because once it's in, it's in. You can't take it out. Whereas if it does get a bit stiff and claggy, you can always top off with a little bit more water at a go. Obviously I feel that with cement, it's going to run out. I could just leave it like that. I'm going to try it with a bit of this cling film on top. I think other people call it saran wrap or something like that. Just a bit of that around it. All an experiment, guys. All an experiment. But a bit of fun. Use my uh, pointing trowel to fill it up, and I can tell already that I haven't mixed enough sand and cement up. Just tamp it down there to get all the air out of it. You want it pretty well as heavy as I can get it for that. Tamp it down. Keep that on that uh, cling film. And then all I do is, uh, is put some coat hanger wire to make a loop. There are many hotel rooms that I haven't been through and had a few coat hangers. Snip them off, good pair of cutters. I just bend it out. Oh, this one's got a nice strong coat hanger wire, this one. So I want it with an angle there so it doesn't pull through the concrete just allow for it to come up a bit make a loop say there I'm going to bend it back down put another little kink in it there snip off just wiggle that down in there I feel that should when it sets hold now let's get the production line going Before the wife finds out, I'm going to be using all her cling film. It's a bit like making sandcastles, guys, this is. Solid sandcastles. Here we go, keep it nice and central. We're on the way now, boys. I just need to knock a lot more of that up to do all those pots. Well, there we go. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Weights all made. I've put the wire loops in, as you can see. Cling film's holding up. That one I put a bit too much in there, and he's uh, squeezing out the bottom, but I figure I'll get my bolster and just trim that off. So I've got those. All I've got to do now is wait for them to dry and then put them on the Weiss cooking scales and see how much they weigh. I mean, three pounds for the small ones. I'm hoping the big ones might go four pounds because that's what I'm going to need out in that deep water and a big tide run. So I'm going to take a bait down to where I think the monsters lurk. Maybe I should sit here and wait for the cement to dry. Well, that's the big weights done. And some of those weights topped out at better than five pounds. But of course, when I drop those down, I fish them either with a, a release, like what we call a roller stroller release, or a spring release, or you could use maybe a piece of say, 10 pound line just to hold that on the trace to get the bait down. When the big fish takes, the concrete weight breaks off, sinks to the bottom, job done.
you can obviously go and make some more. And of course, talking about weird things again. I wasn't going to tell you guys, I really wasn't going to tell you guys this. One of the best baits I had success on last year in still water, just regular cart waters, was... Don't tell them, Graham. Okay, I will. Ground bait paste. Now, you know you get those little 2 mil and 4 mil pellets. They're just coarse pellets that guys just damp and throw out. Loads of people use them. Matchmen use them. This method works really well on match waters. So you can feed your pellets, but you can also put them in damp. You can put them with a swim feeder. But you think, how am I going to get 2 mil on a hook? That's right. A bit tough. You get 4 mil on a bandit hook, but trying to get those small, tiny pellets. So what I do is mush them all up, grind them all up, keep pulping away at them, turn them into a paste bait. Because in the winter, a paste bait used to be really good. We used to make cheese paste in the winter because you could mix stuff with it to make it softer so it didn't go too hard in the water. I use ground bait paste quite a lot, actually. It's been devastating for me. This is how I do it. So here's what I'm using. I've got regular four mil pellets here and they are mashed up wet. In fact, I've overwetted them too much and they've got a bit squidgy. So I've got some bread. Oh, I've put some bran in the margins here, bran and bread in the margins. And I've got a little bit of paste bait I've made up with bread, which has sort of stiffened up the, the paste a bit. I hope you can see this. This ground bait, I tell you, making this paste, this is not a good paste. It's not my best prim, premium quality paste, but it is pretty good stuff. Well, it's good because I just caught fish on it. I just mould it around the hook, but I leave, I make it sort of flat, I suppose you want to say. I leave that hook showing. Now, I'm just out there, I'm not far out. I'm just going to flick it. This weather's changing all the time. Man, it's really windy now. You're giving like 50 mile an hour winds, not good. I'll we'll quiver it rod, we'll put the rod down, check your drag, drag's okay. And I just, you won't probably see it here, with this wide angle lens, I'm just tightening up that tip till the tip moves. Just check this one as well. Be lucky to get to no rain today, right today, and now I was fishing. Trying to squeeze every little bit I can out of this last half hour. Well, I'm pleased to say the blank, I have to say. I'm hoping the microphone's okay on this uh, on this little camera, because it would be dead handy. I've got the umbrella to shelter me. Just going to flick this out underhand. Don't want to go far. Nice crooked cast ground. Well done, you complete plonker. Let's get it out there again. That's about on the money. No, it's not. I'm still not happy. I've got to get these things right. That's better. Put it over the other side. In the summer and the autumn, they'll take on the drop, this paste. It's unbelievable fishing. There we are. Sit back, wait, and try and get some blood circulating through my fingers. Guys, I'm on. There we go. Took me ages, ages, tiny bites that I thought were roach. And there's the fish. Lucky, lucky, lucky. Well, it's not lucky, I haven't got it in, have I? I'm going to have to stand, I can play this and, and get you the action at the same time. On ground bait paste, just a hunch I had. Oh, nice carp. Nice carp, boys. Nice fish. Five, six pounds? Bend in a quiver tip rod cannot be beaten. And I still get good fish as well, you know, that's the thing. I'm freelining with that one BB shot. So they're very, very, very picky. Bit of backwind. Hmm, okay, you know the story. Where's the net? There we go. I've still left my other one out because I've only got about 30 minutes of uh, fishing time. Come on. Get a track wind in there. 
I've got the camera in my mouth, guys. That's why I'm talking funny. It's not because somebody stapled my lips together. I've got the camera in my mouth so I can get this fish. Yes, get in! <laughs> Do you know what, boys? There is nothing better than beating the blank with a nice mirror carp like that on a really crappy day with a crappy forecast. Grey, horrible cloud. And it's only going to get worse. Let's get him up. Oh, yeah. On the mat. Where's that hook? There's a BV. Hook's out. Well, it's howling. It is howling inside of the umbrella. A lucky fish for me. Got that job done for the wife. Was it worth it? As we say at the Totally Awesome Fishing Show, yes it was. Do you know this fish is actually cold? The water's very, very cold. Here at Watmore it's deep. So it tends to be a stable temperature, but because it's been cold all winter, so it's been like stable cold all winter, it's going to take a while to warm up. Calm down. Let's get this guy back in the water. There, now guys, there's that tonic immobility. Turn the fish upside down. Nobody in Britain seems to use it. It's called tonic immobility. Look at that fish. Absolutely stone cold, upside down. Way far from being dead. He is very much alive, trust me. There he goes. Use that to look after your fish. Ah, it's cold. Jeez. Well, as the light started to fade, I missed a couple more bites and then I nailed another fish. Now this ground bait paste, don't forget guys, even though there's not many anglers around there fishing, some uh, commercial fisheries actually feed pellets during the winter to keep their stock fresh, to keep them in good condition. So those carp and all other manner of fish are used to seeing pellets, coarse fish pellets, in the water. If there's matches held at weekends or midweek, they're going to be used to seeing those pellets. And this is why I make the paste up, because those small pellets are sort of mundane as they are. They don't sort of have much in the way of flavourings or colourings, etc. And that's why the fish are so used to seeing them that I feel the ground bait paste is the way to go. So, another nice common carp this time. Bit of tonic immobility, slide it back and away he goes. Great fishing and a great fishing bait. So there you go, people. There's a nice little spread of different types of uh, tips in there for you. Thanks for watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Don't forget to watch Mike's TA Outdoors. Hit the subscribe button on both channels. Hit that little bell, so it's a notification bell, so that you don't have to go looking each week. I wonder if Graham or Mike's got a film up. It just goes, I guess, bing bong, on the phone. I don't have a phone. I have two bean cans and a piece of string still like this. So, there you go. We'll see you next time and hopefully some more tips and some more different species. We'll see you next time.